Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councillor Baker. Here. Councillor Campbell. I think Council Siomo. Councillor Asabi George. Here. Council Flaherty. Here. Councillor Jackson. Council Lamatina. Here. Council McCarthy. Counts. <laughs> Councillor O'Malley. Present. Councillor Presley. Present. Councillor Wu. Present. And Councillor Zakem. Here. Madam President, we have a quorum. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to our weekly city council meeting in our, our beautiful, new, and accessible chamber. Um, today, we have two special presentations before we formally start business. Um, so please hold on. And at this point, I would like to invite up Councillor Siomo uh, to introduce our faith leader for the day. After the invocation is delivered, please remain standing, and Councillor Siomo will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam President. Um, gives me great pleasure to introduce someone that's actually been here several times. Uh, because, oh, I'm sorry. Um, mainly because the work that he does in our community affects so many people, not just Jewish people, but all of our people. And those are the kinds of people we want in this chamber leading us in prayer and uh, setting the tone for our meetings. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rabbi Naftoli Beer. The rabbi had came to Boston almost 30 years ago. He founded the Kalel of Greater Boston, which is the Academy of Talmudic Research. The Kalel, for more than six years ago, completed construction of the first synagogue built in the city of Boston in over 50 years. It is located at 62 Cummings Road in Brighton. The Kalel, as it is commonly known, is an educational and social resource center for the greater Boston community. Thousands of men, women, and children have participated in its programs. It serves also as a postgraduate center for rabbis who are training to com for community leadership positions. To date, the Kalel has graduated over 35 fellows, 12 of whom hold positions in the local community. Brighton is the largest concentrated area of Jewish people in New England due to the great popularity of the Kalel and the services and activities it provides. Rabbi Beer is frequently consulted on social and psychological issues, at times even by local mental health professionals. The rabbi is married to his wife, Judith, has six children, and as of today, 24 grandchildren, soon to be 25 grandchildren. And I think when I first brought him in here many years ago, it was probably around 20. So he's been busy. Uh, it gives me great, great pleasure and honor to uh, introduce Rabbi Neftoli Beer. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. It's really a pleasure to be here again. Uh, Mark asked me, it was my first, second, third time, it's my fifth time, so I'm ready, a popular member of the council. Thank you for uh... <laughs> So I'd like to share with you a story. It goes back 33 years ago. I'm driving with my wife, and at that time, four children from Pittsburgh to New York, and the car breaks down on the highway. And it's not the first time I've had trouble with the car. It's the fourth time in six months. And the Pennsylvania Turnpike, at one point, there's 52 miles between exits. Luckily, we're only a mile from one exit. We got to a tractor garage, because no car garage is there. And the mechanic there spent four hours until he fixed the car. I said, thank you so much. What can I give you? How much does it cost? 60 cents. I said, 60 cents? 60 cents. What was missing was six months ago when somebody put in a new distributor cap, they forgot to put a grounding wire. And that's why you've been having electrical problems with your car these past, this past half a year. I fix it for you. Pay me 60 cents. That's all it costs. And please go on. So, unbelievable story. So what are the lessons from this story? 
One is metaphorical, and one is maybe a practical lesson. Metaphorical lesson. How much is the car worth without the distributor cap? Nothing. With the cap, it's worth thousands of dollars. Well, that's how God looks at his world. Every one of us, if you look around the room, there's no two people who look alike here. If you look around the whole world, the seven billion people, no one has the same continents. One of the greatest miracles of human history, no one looks the same. What is the lesson? The lesson is, is that God is telling us that every one of us has something unique to bring to this world. There is no one that has the same personality, the same intellectual acumen, the same emotional makeup, the same physical makeup. We all are different. And the reason for that is, is because God is saying to us, I need every one of you as an expression, number one, of my desire to give to this world. God's essence is to give and to create and to be a benefactor. In order to be a benefactor, he wants every one of us to be a different recipient of his wanting to give. And every one of us is different. If there's one person missing the world, then God doesn't have his full world anymore because his desire to give is not complete. If that 160 cent, grounding wise missing, the car doesn't work. That's the way we should look at every other human being. We're here together to understand that every one of us is so important because no matter who we are, we are giving something to this world that no one else can, and we, every one of us is a teacher to everyone else. And the world can be complete with every one of us. Imagine if we had to be a carpenter, a lawyer, uh, a doctor, a gardener, go on and on, all at one time, we'd get nothing done. Every one of us gives something to the world that is needed. That's the first lesson. We're all 60 cent wires that the world needs. But then the question is, why did the mechanic not only charge us 60 cents? I mean, after all, he put in four hours of work. Okay, we're nice fellas, but still, you know, four, four hours of work. Maybe he had mercy, compassion, because it's a wife, a husband, a wife, or children, doesn't want to charge you more money. But I think there's something else to learn from this, what happened. He was saying to himself, I'm a professional. My job is to be a mechanic. I feel bad for my profession that there was a mistake made by another mechanic. I don't want the person to walk away thinking that the mechanics as the professionals make mistakes that are not fixable. I'm thinking about the world around me. I'm thinking about my responsibility to my profession as a mechanic. But even more than that, imagine if the first person who made the mistake would know of the idea that it costed us hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars over six months because of a little mistake he made. How would he feel? This mechanic who fixed the car maybe was saying to himself, I'm going to protect his dignity. I'm going to think about the nobility of the first mechanic. If I charge this person, invariably what I'm really doing is I'm taking away from that first person's dignity. My job as a person, my sensitivity as a human being, if God created us all at 60 cent why is, and we're all here for one another because we create a world together. I feel for that person, I, I feel for that pain that person would have if he knew what was happening. I want to take that away from him. When we get together as a city council and we think about how we can make our city a better city and thank you for all the work you put into our city, it's always good to think about not the mistakes other people make, not to compete with others and say, that in my district, the people do this and do that and do that. Always think about, and that's what we should do, think about what is the greatness of every human being. Every human being can give us so much in life because every human being, if, God, if the God is important, then to us, they're important also. And we're always there to say, if somebody makes a mistake, I make mistakes also. You know what? Let me cover for the other person. Let me let the other person retain their dignity and ability. And when we do that and we think like that, we create such a greater world, a world where we all feel good about ourselves ultimately. Because when we think about others in terms of dignity and nobility, and we treat them with that dignity and nobility, we feel the nobility and dignity of every single person. God should bless all of us, and thank you for all of your great work. And if I come back again, I'll smile again. That's if I come back, right? <laughs> I'd like to 
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you so much, Councilor Siomo and, and Rabbi. Today we are also going to celebrate the Festival of Light, uh, the South Asian cultural and, and um, religious ceremony, Diwali. So I'm pleased to introduce someone who has been such a staple for making sure the South Asian community in the greater Boston area and across the Commonwealth has always well represented, a founder of the South Asian Arts Council uh, and ever present in, in City Hall, um, Amit Dixit. Thank you, Michelle, and welcome, little one. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Happy Diwali. Uh, Diwali is a festival of lights where we conquer evil, light over darkness, fighting ignorance, injustice. It's a universal holiday, but it's also a symbol of light. And I thought, what better way than we start with city council chambers this year, and also to highlight an incredible organization that has been doing so much work for our community and continues to work adapted to another community. So the true message of light to dispel fear through dar of darkness and bringing more cultural and more bridge building through a wonderful organization, Medicine Wheel Productions, as our Diwali honoree this year. But first of all, I'd like to first thank uh, City Council President Michelle Wu uh, for everything you do. <laughs> And that Diwali will be, the city hall will be lit tonight for Diwali. And um, it's something that not many other cities do. So thank you once again for uh, creating more benchmarks for the city of Boston. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce the um, ISKCON president uh, for local chapter, Piari Mohan. And last year, we we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of ISKCON, which started here in Boston at 72 Commonwealth Avenue. And we're honored to announce that the first statue dedicated to an Indian spiritual leader that has a twin statue in India, in the entire country, has been approved by the city of Boston, and it will be placed at 72 Commonwealth Avenue as a landmark and bridge, build, bridge building culture exchanges um, for the city of Boston. Thank you. Hare Krishna, uh, thank you. I'd like to thank Michelle Wu also for allowing me to speak here today. I'm going to say a little something about Diwali, my understanding of Diwali. Uh, it's, it, it is uh, representing good over evil. It's representing light. Uh, when one is in darkness, uh, it's, one cannot see or understand exactly things as they are. And in the material world, uh, many of us are influenced by darkness or ignorance. And the Vedic literature explains that re um, usually represents God, not that God is light, but is represented as light, and ignorance is represented as darkness. So Diwali is a time where we try to get out of some of this ignorance we're in. Of course, in Vedic culture, the ignorance isn't so subtle. Most of us, according to Vedic culture, are somewhat in ignorance most of the time. It's like uh, there's a verse from the Bhagavad Gita that explains how as the embodied soul continuously passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death, and a self-realized soul is not bewildered by such a change. So basically, this explains how we're actually all a pure spirit soul, that we're not these bodies. These bodies are a dress that we're wearing. But generally, when someone thinks, they think that they are their body. I had a little baby's body. I had a boy's body. I had a youth's body. I had a man's body. Now I have an old man's body. But I can remember having those other bodies. I can remember having a boy's body and a man's body, but those bodies 
don't exist anymore. I have a little body over here that's disturbed by what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, so those bodies won't exist, but still I exist, so I'm different from my body. So in Vedic culture, it explains that knowledge is understanding that I'm a spirit soul, I'm an eternal servant of God. And all of us are spirit souls, eternal servants of God. Uh, so Diwali is a time to again try to remain in, in the light, try to remain God conscious, try to remember who we actually are. And, and we, we, light, we light candles to try to represent that, to re represent who we actually are. Uh, it's a time to again remind us to go to the light of God and get out of ignorance and reestablish our relationship with God. By acting accordingly, we'll always remain in the light. Of course, when we say always, it's like as much as we can do it. It's like uh, we, we have to start somewhere. It's not that any of us are completely free from this misconception of who we are. But unless we know who we are, everything else after that is, is incorrect. So we have to first understand that. Then there will be peace and prosperity in the world if everyone can understand that they're all spirit, soul, and stop fighting amongst each other with some bodily differences. Anyway, that's all I got to say. Hare Krishna. <laughs> And if Michael, Michael, would you like to say a few words before the ceremony? Okay. So well known to many in this room and, and throughout the city, and Michael Dowling from Medicine Wheel. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, hosting us here today. Um, I'd like to put my 60 cents out on the table. Um, Medicine Wheel is an organization in South Boston where you know, our belief is that every spoke of the wheel is significant. And if one spoke is broken, the wheel is incomplete. Uh, I often say to the young people who work for us, you know, if you stay in the dark, the world may not miss you. If you come out into the light, the world's a better place. So I think it's very appropriate today uh, to be lighting the, the, the dia for Diwali today, uh, honoring Medicine Wheel and some of our work and, and the blessing certainly from the rabbi. Uh, you know, it's a universal message that we all... Um, I've been talking a lot about air, that we all breathe the same air, right? Already each of us has exchanged air that others in this room have already breathed, right? That's a pretty powerful connection that we share. Um, <clears throat> so what, the project that we're honoring is called Hand in Hand, and then you'll see there's four hands at the base of, of the pedestal there. And those are hands of young people and police officers from across the city of Boston. We have now worked with uh, over 150 police officers and 150 young people. Richie, who's with me today, has a goal of 2015 police officers, every rank and file officer for the city of Boston. And I think we'll achieve that goal in the next few years. Uh, we've recently moved into East Boston uh, and have been working with immigrant families and police officers and talking about opening another whole can of worms for our work and deepening our work. Just when I think it can't go any deeper, something opens up in front of me. Um, so I'm always thrilled and always terrified, and, and that's the partnership that I have with my work. Um, and then Amit came to me and he says, you know, the South Asian arts community, the South Asian community, and the South Asian, what's your organization called? Cultural Council. Uh, also struggle with their relationship with law enforcement, and so there's been a lot of hate crimes that directed that community. And wouldn't it be great if we had a hand-in-hand -hand application with the South Asian uh, communities? So that's our next piece of outreach. So I'm very, very excited to be here today. Um, very excited to be breathing the air with so many people who believe you know, in the goodness in each of us and that shared goodness and how we can amplify that. If we all put 60 cents on the table, it starts to add up pretty quickly and the room gets a lot brighter, right? And we learn a lot about each other, right? who we can be for ourselves, and more importantly, who we can be for each other. So thank you so much.
So if I could ask um, Michael and um, Councillor Siomo and Rabbi, if you'd like to join the ceremony, our, our Vice President, Councillor Baker, uh, will light the candle right in front here. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite up Councillor Presley for our second presentation. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it has certainly uh, already been a very uplifting afternoon. Uh, hopefully, I can uh, continue to keep us on that, that path. Uh, the people that are coming before us certainly uh, elevate me and so many of us each and every day. Uh, I wanted to bring before us for the second time the Haley House Bakery and Cafe uh, Poetry Slam team. Um, we all know Haley House. I consider it to be a very special and inclusive place. Uh, ostensibly social work in the form of a restaurant. Uh, it is the heartbeat of Roxbury and Dudley, uh, and uh, we are grateful for their many civic contributions. In fact, just last night, in partnership with Jose uh, Masso, they hosted a Roxbury for Puerto Rico uh, fundraiser to support uh, the relief uh, recovery 
um, and reconstruction efforts, and also the resettling efforts, you know, here. So Haley House is, is always doing wonderful things, and we, we know that there uh, are a shortage of um, artist space and performance venues, and uh, Haley House recognizing this in 2014 uh, became certified as a poetry venue. And so uh, every second and fourth Friday of the month, the doors open at 630, 18 plus, for food, open mic, featured poet, and competitive poetry slam. Uh, in fact, uh, not that long ago, I hosted there uh, an event in honor of Maya Angelou on her birthday called In the Name of Maya. So it has really become this incredible sort of artist collective. And I wanted to bring them before us today. I know uh, we are very proud of our championship uh, sports teams, um, but we boast other champions as well uh, in the artist space that are um, uh, nationally recognized. And so without further ado, I wanted to bring before you the Haley House Slam team. Uh, this is a 2017 team. They just competed in Denver in um, Colorado in August, and they are ranked third in the nation. Uh, so they'll introduce themselves, and then they are going to uh, share a piece with us. everybody how's it going good my name is Portia Olaiola um, and I'm one of the co-founders of the house slam at the Haley house bakery and cafe so we we're founded in 2014 um, in our first year of existence um, we have been the only we were the only poetry slam venue in the history of poetry slam um, to win all three national titles um, which is a huge feat it's a huge feat um, and the last two years, we've placed third at the National Poetry Slam. Um, we are we house the reigning Women of the World Poetry Slam champion, uh, Kofi Dadzi. Um, this person here uh, just placed second at the International Youth Poetry Slam. He just placed fifth at the Individual World Poetry Slam. Uh, Zenaida Peterson just. Um, held the inaugural uh, Thim Slam tournament that brought um, tons of folks here from all over the country um, to compete, right? So feminine identified folks, which literally revolutionized slam, right? So all of these awesome and wonderful things are happening um, in the city, in Boston, in Dudley, in Roxbury. Um, and it's, it's been great. It's been happening with uh, folks of color, uh, with queer folks, um, it's free, right? And so anybody is welcome. Uh, we're young folks, um, and we're hoping to like just keep that fire. That what, what's happening in the city, what we're claiming, and what we're showing to the world, and what we're bringing back. We it's something that we want to keep going, right? So I'm doing a networking plug. So if folks know anybody, um, we're we're definitely interested in like um, building a space for artists, right? Having a house for all of these things that are happening. Um, and that's just my shameless plug. Um, I guess I'll introduce folks, or folks will introduce themselves, and then we'll we'll, we'll do a poem, and we'll leave you, leave you all. But are you? You're this is Eric Hagen. Uh, hi, I, I'm Eric Hagen. <laughs> I was born and raised in Boston. Um, I uh, went to high school at Boston Latin Academy. Um, and oh, cool. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and. Uh, this, this um, group of people um, and creating this space um, in Boston, it was the first time that a Poetry Slam venue was ever in the city of Boston, not in Cambridge. Um, and that's not to say anything bad about Cambridge, but it meant a lot to me that it was in Roxbury where I went to high school. Um, and, and, th and thank you all so much for honoring these group of people here. Hello, I'm Kofi Dodzi. Uh, uh, I'm, from, I'm originally from White Plains, New York, uh, went to high school in Westboro, and I'm very, very grateful to this space right here because for a very, very long time, I really didn't really feel like I had much of a medium for me to like voice my opinions and voice and like use my art as my activism. And I'm really just grateful to this community that I've been fostered by and really just been cultivated by as an artist. Hi everyone. My name is Mar Why are you laughing at me. Uh, my name is Marshall Gilson. Uh, I'm a poet. I don't know. I've been on the House Slam team for the last two years. 
Um, I've been on a lot of different teams over the course of my life. I've been slamming for like 10 years now, and I don't know how slam is really unique and really special and really different, and I really hope that you will enjoy what we do and support us going forward. Yay. Hi, everybody. I'm Angelica Maria. Um, I'm from Los Angeles originally, but I've lived in Boston for the last three years. Um, I came here and found Slam Poetry and was basically cultivated by the community here that were so gracious and just held me like a little baby. And <laughs> I've gotten so many opportunities um, because of that, and I'm so thankful for that. And thanks. Right, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Angelica's doing a, a TED Talk. She left that out, but that's <laughs> happening. Um, yeah, my name is Zenaida Peterson, and um, I'm originally from Atlanta, um, and I've been living in Boston for about six years. Um, and uh, I echo what a lot of folks have said. I'm extremely grateful to the House Slam community. Um, the founders were are absolutely the reason that... Um, I'm writing uh, the way that I do now and have like grown, I've grown a lot as an artist um, and an organizer and um, a lot of people behind me um, like really supported me and uh, my uh, slam, like my organizing team for uh, cultivating a space for feminine people um, and it's been like truly inspiring. Um, so yeah, I'm really, and I'm also really grateful to be here. Um, uh, and thankful to be here, especially on this day with a beautiful ceremony. So thank you all so much. And I guess we'll do this. Oh. <laughs> okay, where all are we right, going? Get in order. Are we doing it up here? Yeah, I think so, right? We should do it up there. I don't know. I think. I don't like having things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, we're <laughs> Sorry, we're artists. Yeah. We're figuring it out. We met at an anti-racist workshop. At a bar. We were the only nerds at a party. We worked at the same restaurant. They were an Aquarius. A, a poet. poet. A psychologist. A shrink. They were cute. The way white people can be cute. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. We, we date, date white people, people sometimes. sometimes. It was just one time. It was more, more than one time. time. It was summer. A wild night where we got away from the trap music and, and got, got trapped, trapped in each other. other. Suburbia fears brown skin, especially, especially when there are only four of you in town. But he didn't. She didn't. They, they didn't. didn't. Dating white people is fascinating. They say like... Wanna go to this, this indie, indie show at a landfill, landfill where everyone sits on tire swings and plays tin cans? They wear socks with sandals. Leave the front door open? Start things on time. Use mayonnaise like I use peppers. When, when dating, dating white people, people you get, get a lot of nice free like vacations. Or not pulled over. Or not followed in the grocery store. They taught me how to swim. They taught me how to love. She, she held, held me after, after Ferguson, Ferguson when, when I broke down. down. Said it would be okay. They, they loved, loved everything, everything about, about me. me. They said, I love your big black lips. Can I s*** around you? You're, You're not black black. You're my exotic spice. Do we have to make everything about race? And, and suddenly, suddenly, I didn't, didn't have anything, anything to say. say. I felt the room shrink around me. I loved them. I already loved them. And I laughed. I, I said, said nothing. nothing. He asked me why I get so quiet sometimes. I said there's a space between us I don't know how to fill. I told him some words in Spanish don't translate. Some, some feelings, feelings don't, don't translate. translate. They said, you don't have to code switch with me. You, you can, can talk to me about anything. What they mean is, can you undo the ways you protect yourself from whiteness? Can you split open for me? I, I want to see everything. everything. I, I want everything. everything. I stayed because I was taught to be grateful when white people choose me. And, and how silly we were to think, think we could love a history out of someone. someone. And she was a nice girl, even, even if she mistook my hair for cotton. I ignored it all because I thought it was love. And, and maybe, maybe I stayed, stayed because the world is a lonely, lonely place. place. Because love feels like a miracle. Feels, feels like winning, and I was so tired of loss. I left a white person, but I was still in a relationship with whiteness. I, I was, was born, born into one. one. I got tired of being an instruction manual. My, My voice, voice a language lesson. lesson. My, My existence, existence an exhibit. exhibit. I wanted picnics in the park with no lynching at the end. I wanted my body to be a homeland with no bloodshed. I wanted somebody to love me. Stormless. Quiet. Quiet. Without, Without having, having to anticipate, anticipate the breaking of dams. I finally left because love does not conquer whiteness. Because, because I was tired of trying to turn a white lie into a white savior. savior. 
because, because everything, everything I ever said, said to them, them dissolved into, into white noise. noise. Sorry to make you all go back and forth. We want to bring you up. We want to take a photo with you all. Thank you so much. Oh, this is uh, just a resolution. The Boston City Council extends its congratulations to the Haley House Slam Team in recognition of your high rankings at the 2017 National Poetry Slam. Thank you for uh, informing and elevating our consciousness and for holding this space. Thank you okay. so much. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 <laughs> it's so weird, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just short. <laughs> Look at all of them. Yeah. I don't know which one I'm looking at. It's all fine. of them. I can't see that far. Okay. <laughs> I think I have one. Now you Oh, here you are. Thank you again to um, everyone for that great start to the meeting. We'll begin with approval of the minutes from last meeting. Any amendments or edits? Seeing and hearing none, the minutes stand approved. And Madam Clerk, if we could begin with communications from His Honor the Mayor. And let's read dockets 1373 and 74 together, please. Thank you. Docket number 1373, message in order to reduce the FY18 appropriation for the, <coughs> sorry, for the reserve collective bargaining by $74,601 to provide funding for the Boston Public Health Commission for the FY18 increase, increases contained within the collective bargaining agreement between the Boston Public Health Commission and the Boston Public I'm sorry, and the Public Health Nurses, 1199 SEIU. Docket number 1374, message in order approving a supplemental appropriation of $74,601 for the Public Health Commission for FY18 to cover cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreement between the Boston Public Health Commission and the Public Nurses Local, 1199 SEIU. The terms of the contract are, October 1st, 2016 through October September 30th, 2017, and October 1st, 2017 through September 30th, 2020. The major provisions of the contract include base wage increases of 2%, effective the first pay period of January of each fiscal year. The agreements also contain other benefits, including a new step in 2019, Filed in the office of the city clerk, October 23rd, 2017. On dockets 1374 and 1373 and 1374, chair recognizes the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, Councilor Siomo. Thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, dockets 1373 and 1374 are supplemental appropriation to fund the FY18 portion of the collective bargaining agreement and fund the $78,601 through the city's collective bargaining reserves. Uh, SEIU represents approximately 30 registered nurses and nurse practitioners employed by the Boston Public Health Commission. It, regarding the collective bargaining agreement between the Boston Public Health Commission and the Public Health Nurses Local 1199 SEIU, consists of two consecutive agreements covering the four-year period of October 1, 2016 through September 30th, 2020. Um, effective each January of the uh, 16, 17, 18, and 19, 
will uh, be given 2% general wage increases. It also creates a new step 12 at 2% higher than step 11 as of the date, as of that date. Eligibility for new paid parental leave benefits consistent with the council's 2015 ordinance. Additional language and policy modifications include limits on entitlement to redemption of unused sick leave at retirement, enhancement of professional development, education, and training provisions to promote consistency and control costs, agreement to develop and implement a reasonable suspicion drug and alcohol policy during the term of the successor agreement, addition of provisions designed to mitigate staffing vacancies. The Committee on Ways and Means has held five hearings on collective bargaining agreements since the beginning of the calendar year. And this collective bargaining agreement is substantively the same. Therefore, I, I ask for suspension and passage of these two dockets. Thank you, Councilor Siomo. Would anyone else like to comment or ask a question? Okay, at this time, Councilor Siomo moves for acceptance, uh, or moves for suspension of the rules and passage of dockets 1373 and 1374. Uh, before we take the votes, Madam Clerk, could you please mark that Councilor Jackson is here? And we'll start with docket 1373. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1373 has been passed. And on docket 1374, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. And docket 1374 has been passed. Docket number 1375, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,257,011.60 in the form of a grant for federal fiscal year 18, Title III-B, Supportive Services, awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs to be administered by the Elderly Commission. The grant will fund a comprehensive and coordinated health and social service system which assists elders to maintain independent living in their own communities as long as desired. Docket 1375 will be assigned to the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities. Docket number 1376, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend a grant of $474,233.75 for the federal fiscal year 18, Title III-A, Area Plan Administration, awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, passes through the Mass Executive Office of Elders of Elder Affairs to be administered by the Elderly Commission. The grant would fund administrative expenses of the Elder Elderly Commission Area Agency on Aging. Docket 1376 will also be assigned to the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities. Docket number 1377, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend a grant of $225,044 for the FY 2017 DNA Capacity Enhancement and Backlog Reduction Program awarded by the National Institute of Justice to be awarded to be administered by the police department. The grant would fund two criminalist positions, lab supplies, and continuing education expenses. Docket 1377 will be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Docket number 1378, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend a grant of $71,507 for the Startup Manager Grant awarded by the Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston to be administered by the Office of Economic Development. The grant will fund a startup manager's position in the Office of Economic Development. Docket 1378. Um I'm told there was a, is there a movement to, motion to pass. suspend and pass? We don't have the chair. That chair retired last week. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> In case you didn't I'm the vice chair. <laughs> Councilor Flaherty, yeah. as vice yeah, chair of the committee chair. on planning and move, development. Move a suspension of rules and passage, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councilor. <laughs> Councilor Siomo, did you want to speak on this docket as well? Okay. <laughs> Still adjusting. At this time, uh, Councillor Flaherty moves for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1378. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. 
The ayes have it. Docket 1378 has been passed. Reports of public officers and others. Docket number 1379, communication was received from the city clerk of the filing by the Boston Redevelopment Authority of the Second Amendment to the report and decision on the Bridgeview Apartments Chapter 121A project. Docket 1379 will be placed on file. Reports of committees. Docket number 0135, the Committee on Government Operations, to which was referred on January 11, 2017, docket <clears throat> number 0135, a petition for a special law regarding an act concerning insurance benefits for surviving spouses submits a report <clears throat> recommending the petition ought to pass in a new draft. Chair recognizes the Chair of the Committee on Government Operations, Councillor Flaherty. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, prior to July 1st of 2000, if a surviving spouse of a City of Boston employee who was either killed in the line of duty um, or died from their injuries sustained uh, in the performance of duty or died from a disability which they had received from the performance of their duty, would uh, lost their pension and health care benefits if he or she remarried. Uh, on uh, July 1st of 2000, Mass Legislature acknowledged this injustice and repealed the what they term the remarriage penalty, but reinstated the pension benefits only. Uh, however, there's still been an issue of surviving spouses not having access to or having the option to purchasing City of Boston health care insurance. Uh, so what I proposed at the time was a home rule petition uh, working uh, with our Boston firefighters that would amend the Mass General Law so that surviving spouses would not have to wait to remarry in order to access health insurance coverage through the City of Boston. Uh, we expect that to be minimal financial impact to the City of Boston's budget uh, because it would only apply to a handful of individuals. Uh, the Committee on Government Operations held a hearing back on May the 9th of 2017. Um, F, uh, Firefighter Local 17 President Richie Paris testified as well as Mayor Walsh's current uh, Chief of Staff but former CEO uh, Dave Sweeney. And also in attendance today uh, representing Local 718 is Bobby Petiti and, and Michael O'Reilly. Uh, the Committee discussed the cost of the City, who would be covered, who wouldn't under the proposal provisions and language changes, and uh, the language uh, has been amended uh, since the proposal's initial filing. Provisions uh, that have been added state that the appropriate insurance application must be filed with the City of Boston, that the City develop a method for payment of premiums in accordance with the rules and regulations, that the City of Boston contributes at least 50% of the premium to be paid by the surviving spouse for such group insurance. The amended language is specific to firefighters in the City of Boston, Passage of this proposal in the amended version will allow surviving spouses to maintain health insurance benefits consistent with their pension benefits. Uh, as Chair of the Committee on Government Operations, uh, with respect to Docket 0135, uh, an act concurring insurance benefits for surviving spouses, I recommend that this matter ought to pass in a new draft. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. At this time, Councilor Flaherty moves for acceptance of the committee report and passage of Docket 0135. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0135 has been passed. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll on Docket 0135? Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo. Yes. Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Jackson. Yes. Councilor Jackson, yes. Councilor Lamatina. Yes. Councilor Lamatina, yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor McCarthy, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Presley. Yes. Councilor Presley, yes. Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. And Councilor Zakem. Yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Madam President, we have a unanimous vote for docket number 0135. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 0135 has been passed unanimously in a new draft. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Docket number 1380, Councilor Wu offered the following ordinance regarding the appointments to the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. I'm going to defer to the uh, chair of the Special Committee on the Community Preservation Act for further comment, but just wanted to clarify, I know it's rare that we have uh, further legislative action on an item that was already voted on earlier in the legislative year, uh, but this ordinance just makes a technical adjustment to the timelines in order for everything to line up and for us to have as much time as possible to promote the, the concept that people can apply for the Community Pres Preservation Committee. Uh, so for further, further detail, um, Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I want to thank you uh, for filing this amendment, which will allow the City Council's Special Committee on the CPA and the CPA Working Group more time to review based on the timelines that you had just mentioned. But take this opportunity just to give everyone a quick uh, 
update uh, the City Council Special Committee on the Community Preservation Act had its first meeting on Thursday, October the 12th. In attendance was Christine Puff, the City's uh, Community Preservation Director, along with several uh, of our colleagues here, as well as members of the working group. The following matters were discussed. Now, the status of how much CPA revenue has been generated to date, a tentative timeline for marketing, the CPC application, the deadline, and what other meetings and action steps need to be taken, the application for Boston residents to apply to be on the Community Preservation Committee went public as of last Thursday, October the 19th, and the deadline is Thursday, November 9th. So if my colleagues uh, have any constituents, uh, community leaders uh, that are interested in participating and serving, get their resume in as soon as uh, possible, get those applications filled out. Uh, once the reviewing of the applications is done, the committee plans to call uh, in the final nominees for the committee hearing, and we intend to have the appointments in place by the last council meeting on December the 13th. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Uh, so I want to just entertain any questions or comments and then ask for suspension and passage of this to make sure everything is, is tied up um, before the time frame that the or original ordinance had specified. Um, you all have this before you, but the original ordinance that we passed had said that the, the four council CPC seats needed to be in place within 90 days, uh, and that, that has been that means 90 days from when it was signed by the mayor, which would put us at needing to finish everything and vote on it by the first week of November, uh, which doesn't give enough time to properly mark it. So the adjustment is to make it match up with the 90-day working group that the council had created, changing the 90 days to 160 days, which would, again, as Councillor Flaherty said, um, put us at that meeting in December. Any questions? Okay, then at this time, uh, chair moves for suspension and passage of docket 1380. All in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll. Docket 1380. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo. Yes. Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Jackson. Yes. Councilor Jackson, yes. Councilor Lamatina. Yes. Councilor Lamatina, yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor McCarthy, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Presley. Yes. Councilor Presley, yes. Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. And Councilor Zakem. Yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Madam President, docket number 1380 receives a unanimous vote. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 1380 has been passed unanimously. Personnel orders. Docket number 1381, Councilor Wu offered for the following order. Chair moves for suspension and passage of docket 1381. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1381 has been passed. Docket number 1382. Councilor Wu offered the following order. And chair order. moves for suspension and passage of docket 1382. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1382 has been passed. I am informed by the clerk that there is one late filed matter, which in the absence of objection will be added to the agenda. Uh, hearing none, the matter is added. Madam Clerk, could you please read that first late file? Thank you, Madam President. Offered by Councilor Michael F. Flaherty in the City Council, order for a hearing on the siting and impacts on technical and telecommunication-based infrastructure upgrades. Whereas the City of Boston is going through an era of rapid growth and development, which is resulting in continual, continued population growth. Whereas the City of Boston has an obligation to inform its constituents through all forms of communication and public process on any changes to the infrastructure. Now, therefore, it be ordered that the appropriate committee on the Boston City Council holds a hearing to examine the impacts of the siting of small cell, small wireless, and distributed antenna systems. Representatives from the City of Boston's Department of Innovation and Technology, the City of Boston's Transportation Department, the City of Boston's Public Improvements Commission, the City of Boston's Department of Public Works, and other interested parties shall be invited to testify. Filed in the Council on October 25th, 2017. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Be mindful of the need to make uh, constant infrastructure upgrades and repairs, um, particularly around uh, technology and telecommunication-based infrastructure. Uh, they're termed small cell, small wire, but there's nothing small about them. My phone has been lighting up from across the city uh, as contractors continue to go out and just place them. So people will go to work and uh, they'll call say, what's going on with the light pole in front of my house? Uh, what's happening down the on the end of my corner with the street light, and then they come back from work or wherever they're doing this, this big 
uh, giant, uh, you know, sort of a bottom-based uh, light pole that's in front of the house. No science behind it. Uh, I don't think they're being really judicious as to where to place them. In fact, they're putting them outside of people's bedrooms uh, with noise emanating, yet there might be a vacant lot uh, or an area in the street where there's no home where they should put it, but they continue to just plop these things down. So I'm getting calls from Beacon Hill throughout all of our neighborhoods that have uh, significant concerns. So this is a order for a hearing. Hopefully we can have an expedited hearing because it's happening citywide uh, in which we could uh, identify uh, bringing more awareness. Uh, they say that they're on the website. Uh, that and a cup of coffee sometimes get you a cup of coffee. So um, lack of awareness as to uh, where they're going uh, and what, if any, of the neighbors can do about the uh, displeasing aesthetic features. Find out what, in, what other types of models do they have. Is this, is the, is this the base model and the standard model that we're going to have to eat throughout all of our neighborhoods, or can we do something that is a little bit more consistent to um, the street lights and street poles? Uh, there might even be a discussion that we can have with respect to our fire pole boxes, uh, very needed and very necessary in the case of emergency or when cell service goes down. But there may be an opportunity to increase the infrastructure upgrades through our uh, fire uh, pole boxes as well. So uh, again, a number of different opportunities and ideas, none of which has been discussed publicly. So order is for a hearing as soon as possible and invite uh, our constituents uh, as well as uh, folks from the Transportation Department, folks from the PIC, folks from the Department of Public Works, folks from Innovation and Technology and find out who's making these decisions and why. And more importantly, can we give folks that are in the neighborhood a little bit more opportunity and awareness, but also uh, a chance to maybe suggest another location on that particular street uh, that is either uh, best for everyone on that, in the, on that street in that neighborhood or maybe even uh, you know, something that's more aesthetically pleasing. And less and emanating less sound. Thank you, Madam President, and urge my colleagues to sign on and participate. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Madam Clerk, could you please add Councillor Baker's name, add Councillor Campbell, Councillor Siomo, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor La Matina, Councillor McCarthy, Councillor Presley, Councillor Zakum, Councillor Jackson. Please add the chair's name. And Councillor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I rise to commend the maker, ask that my name be added. Uh, this is a very important issue, and it's, it's a great quality of life issue, and I'm glad uh, Councillor Flaherty is, is leading on this. Um, it, it's not only about aesthetics, it's not only about you know, noise emitted uh, obstructions, but it really seems to be another example. Unfortunately, many of these public utilities, uh, you know, asking for permission after, what's the old expression? I'm, if, it's easier to ask for permission, than, forgiveness than permission in a lot of the case, thank you. Um, I don't have, think I've had my cup of coffee today. But um, I think it's an important issue that we need to get out in front of and that we can really uh, exert some leadership. We're the closest to the uh, folks on the streets. We see this each and every day. Just wanted to commend Councilor Flaherty. I look forward to an expedited hearing. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley. Madam Clerk, could you please add Councilor O'Malley's name? And the late file matter will be, will be assigned to the Committee on City and Neighborhood Services and Veterans Affairs. There are two late filed matters which in the absence of objection need to be added to the consent agenda. Hearing none, uh, the matters are added and Chair moves adoption of the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> <laughs> the ayes have it. And um, the consent agenda is adopted. Is there any councillor who wishes to pull an item from the green sheets? Okay. Then we will pause here for any statements or announcements to the group. Okay. Okay. Then um, I'd like to invite all councillors and guests to please rise. Today, the Boston City Council will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Councilor Campbell, Anthony Cataldo, Jr. For Councilor La Matina, Maxine Tassinari, Texaria. For Councilor O'Malley, Joseph M. Wilson, and Jan Quirum, longtime city employee. For Councilors Isabi George and La Matina, James Dancy Sr. And for Councilor Baker, Patty Murphy Holbrook. A moment of silence, please.
Thank you. Chair moves that when the council adjourns today, we do so in memory of the aforementioned individuals. We're scheduled to meet again Wednesday, November 1st at 12 noon in the Ionella Chamber at Boston City Hall. All in favor of adjournment say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.